Okay, so our next presentation is by Brian, and he's actually going to talk about using random effect, effects in a, a general model for doing fishery stock assessment. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Brian Stock. Uh, it's been fun over the years. Thanks to um, for having me here at Capum to see uh, all the different workshops at Capum that have been right across the street in San Diego is really convenient. Um, this one is a little farther afield, um, which is means you get me, uh, but you don't get Tim, who's the brains and the nimble coding fingers behind a lot of the stuff that we've done together uh, over the last few months. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about WAM or WAM or WAM, uh, but it just stands for the Woods Hole Assessment Model. Um, I've been developing it at the Northeast Fishery Science Center in Woods Hole. Uh, the two key words here are state space and environmental covariates. That, those are the main motivations. Uh, so a little bit of background on the stock assessments and how they're done in the Northeast and why they're done that way. Um, here we are in uh, Woods Hole, Massachusetts, responsible for doing assessments basically from where uh, Eric's lab in the Southeast uh, leaves off at Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, from there north to Canada. Um, a lot of uh, groundfish species, uh, flounders and uh, cod, um, have a, a long history of, fish, of fishing very hard on these stocks. Uh, there's a lot of age data, so most of the age structured assessments are done with empirical weighted age and not fitting growth. Uh, a lot of the stock assessments have major uh, retrospective patterns. This is a draft figure from uh, Chris Legault. Uh, I think the should probably flip the color, but just notice that there's a lot, uh, blue is bad and red is good, uh, but there's a lot of each. Uh, the uh, age structured models are mostly conducted using uh, something called ASAP, which is a traditional statistical catch at age model that uh, Chris Legault uh, developed and helped maintain, it's written in ADMB. Um, about half of the stocks have uh, age, are done with uh, age structured models. Uh, the other ones are done with simpler models when the age structured models get rejected or maybe there's some other reason. Uh, and then within the, so the assessment framework is divided into um, operational or tactical uh, assessments that are done to give catch advice, uh, done on the, uh, just looking at different parameterizations maybe of a, a small set of models and they're on the, maybe done every year or two. Uh, as a, in, in contrast to a research or benchmark uh, assessment, where you're looking at uh, big structural changes, maybe different model frameworks, uh, maybe done every five years or so for a species. And so right now, uh, WAM is, is designed to live in this kind of space, but uh, there is going to be a, or this plan to have a uh, working group in 2023 to look at and fully evaluate using WAM as a possible replacement for ASAP in some of the Northeast Center uh, assessments. All right, so that's the background of the Northeast. Um, this is what Tim was gonna present on if he was able to make it, but he wasn't able to. Um, Tim in, uh, with uh, Ernesto and Anders and Kelly and a bunch of other people in the room uh, through the ICES methods working group have been doing a comparison of uh, traditional uh, statistical catch at age models with uh, state space equivalents or rough equivalents. Uh, it's not a simulation study. They're fitting um, to data on 13 stocks in the North Atlantic uh, with as little tinkering as possible allowed to try to optimize the model for the different stocks. Um, and then of note to some of the discussions we've been having here with standardizing input and output and stuff, um, it's required writing some scripts to convert input between the various models that were being fit in this uh, analysis. And then just some uh, preliminary results from Tim. Um, these are the various stocks. Don't look at, uh, this is just to show that they, they do have preliminary results, not really to look at it specifically, but uh, the state space models have tended to have lower uh, retrospective patterns than the statistical catch at age models. Uh, and then uh, the WAM framework uh, is written in TMB, like Andres was talking about, you can turn on and off the random effects. So within WAM, you can turn it into a state space or non-state space model. Uh, and when you do turn on the random effects, uh, it typically performs better with lower AIC and, 
has more realistic, uh, larger uncertainty in, um, in the output. Uh, so that is one big motivation for the Northeast Center developing uh, state, uh, a state-based assessment framework. Uh, the other is this is kind of all covered by Anders, uh, so I probably won't spend too much time on it, but there's a lot of other um, benefits of uh, using random effects or, or state space models. Uh, you're actually estimating the process variance uh, as opposed to assuming it known, uh, and that'd be like a penalized, penalized fixed effect. Uh, easily handles missing observations. Anders talked about that quite a bit, and then it's uh, natural and easy to include time variation in uh, other demographic processes, all of the different you know, things we have, recruitment, mortality, growth, can be time varying um, quite easily. So not even thinking about the environmental effects, it would be useful for the Northeast Center to have a state-based assessment framework. Um, this is how the different options or how uh, WAM is a state-based model. Um, it can act as as a statistical catch at age model where your um, predicted uh, numbers at age and time are um, a function of, or deterministic, just a function of the previous state, uh, or you can turn on uh, random effects on recruitment um, and note that the um, traditional statistical catch at age models can can do this, although they don't estimate that uh, variance parameter. Um, so you could either estimate that or not in WAM. Uh, and then what we're calling the full state space model is allowing, instead of just the numbers at age one to have a random effect, allowing uh, all ages to have a variance parameter. Uh, and it was designed in this way so that we could easily test uh, for a stock that has an ASAP model. We can run it in WAM and try to reproduce the same results if we use this version. Uh, this is, so all the code right now is on GitHub um, and that's kind of where I've come in. Tim did a lot of work to develop the uh, CPP file or the, the really the WAM model. It's uh, modularized and, um, and then I, we've worked together to turn it into an R package. So now you can go on GitHub, you can uh, install using dev tools. When you install it, it will compile the C++ file on your computer. And then you have, uh, you can just library wham. And then we've written functions in R to um, read in data files, prepare the input, specify the model, uh, fit the model. Um, and then this is all kind of modularized in R. So there's different functions that the fit wham function is then calling. So we have a, a fit TMB that's kind of general and gets used in, in um, subsequent, uh, like down the, in the workflow. So in the fit general uh, function, we can turn on or off uh, retrospective analysis, uh, doing the one step ahead residuals that um, Anders and team have developed for uh, in TMB. Uh, so that function calls the fit peel function, which is then redoing the data inputs and then calling that fit TMB function again. Um, you can turn on and off this one step head residual function and then to do projections, it's uh, again calling the fit wham after modifying the input. Uh, and then after you fit the model, we have a like plot output function, which is uh, yet again, uh, lifts code from r for ss uh, and then this ASAP plots, which is again, another set of generic uh, output that um, Chris Legault has uh, written and developed. And this just all gets dumped into an HTML file uh, like r for ss does. So thanks for letting me steal your code. Uh, and then there's a check convergence function and a compare models function, because that's one of the main features that we're trying to do is be able to, within this framework to fit um, different models and then compare them with ASE and then also the retrospective uh, Mohn's row uh, statistics. And so because all of this is on uh, GitHub, you can uh, fork it, modify it to do something that you want and then just happily do your own thing. Or you could also, if it's written in a general way, you could um, you know, try to merge it back in uh, and submit a pull request and it could grow. A uh, question that people have been asking, uh, rightfully so, is, is how is WAM different from SAM? And this was a good opportunity for me to go back in the equations and really uh, get my head wrapped around it. So 
Uh, on the left, we have Wham. On the right is how Sam does things. Um, so the catch observation model in Wham is like ASAP, uh, in that you have aggregate catch in each year, not uh, like Sam has catch in uh, numbers at age for each year. Um, so Wham is fitting to the aggregate catch and then uh, age composition in each year. And there's several different options for what likelihood you want to use. Uh, and then the other big difference is uh, how uh, fishing mortality is configured. So Sam has uh, a random walk on uh, fishing mortality where the deviations are, uh, there's several different options for how these are correlated across years uh, and ages. Uh, Wham is configured like uh, ASAP where we have uh, selectivity and there's a few different options for that. Uh, and then um, fishing mortality is again, um, random walk except these, the deviations in fishing mortality are estimated as uh, free parameters right now. They're not uh, fixed, uh, not random effects. Uh, so those are the two main differences. Um, um, this is straight from Tim. Why is Wham done this way differently from Sam? Uh, main motivation, like I've said a couple times, is that it's useful if it can approximate ASAP, which is our current model that we're using. Uh, and then it claims that the Wham uh, observation model for catch or landings data is natural if you have uh, weights and age compositions. Those, that's like what you're directly measuring. Um, and then the how F and selectivity are treated can be useful for projections. For example, if you don't, I think Anders touched on this briefly, but you don't, if you don't want to uh, just project forward a, a random walk on F in the future, it might be useful to say, you know, F is something um, specified. Uh, and if you're calculating these uh, reference points that are, that depend on F, uh, you may want, um, you may want to specify an F that's different, that is actually applied to the population to calculate a reference point. Um, so that's another reason why we've uh, done this. All right, so that was all not considering uh, environmental effects, just the general WAM state space um, framework. Uh, second big um, motivation is to uh, easily incorporate environmental effects. Um, motivated in part because the uh, Northeast US shelf has been rapidly warming a lot more than the rest of the world. And um, in some of the like climate action plan documents uh, at the Northeast Center, uh, the number one priority has uh, been recommended to continue development of assessment models that can include uh, environmental terms. Um, yeah, so this, uh, allows us to test for environmental stock recruit relationships in the, in the population dynamics model, as opposed to uh, what people have often done in the past, which is testing for relationships between assessment model output and treating them as data. Um, Tim and colleagues have done a number, uh, a few different studies uh, that, are that have estimated environmental effects in this framework and found that they had uh, reduced retrospective patterns. Uh, and uh, lower residual variance. So the like, kind of canonical example that we use, have been using as our case study and, and testing these features that we're building in uh, is uh, recruitment of uh, yellowtail flounder and how it's related to the cold pool or in the Gulf Stream indices. Uh, it was also done an example on um, cod and having an effect of temperature on, on growth and maturity. And then uh, Cecilia O'Leary did a paper on summer flounder and effects of the Gulf Stream on uh, mortality and recruitment. Um, so going through the uh, recruitment of yellowtail flounder example, uh, there, uh, so there's, uh, there's been this uh, hypothesized effect of temperature on uh, recruitment for a number of decades. I um, mean, it started out um, just simply looking at, this is catch, so there's a lot of things that could be going on here and why it's going up and down and why it may or may not be related to temperature or other things. Um, but in general, when uh, temperatures were really high in the 40s and in early 50s, and that is also when the catches were, were greatly reduced. And then in recent years, uh, catches have also been much lower than in previous years. Uh, that has since been refined to have a more mechanistic uh, hypothesis that is relating the survival of uh, 
one-year-olds uh, to the extent of this cold pool that forms in the winter. So yellowtail flounder is a this is at the southern extent of its range. So the, if there's more cold water available, that's generally good for their uh, survival. Um, and this index has, has varied in time. And um, we can model those observations of the cold pool index uh, as a state in the assessment model. Um, so that it was X of T, Y of T is our observations. Um, so you get something like this. Uh, it handles missing observations, which is nice and it's easy to do. Uh, we currently have two options. You can model an environmental covariate as random walk or AR1 process, although we're um, going to be hopefully implementing a couple of more options. Uh, we have different options for estimating the observation error. You can either specify it, not estimate it. You can estimate one value across all years, or you can estimate that as another random effect. Uh, and then once you have your uh, estimated cold pool index, then you can plug that into its, its effect on recruitment can be parameterized in different ways. So we've, uh, following this uh, Allison Beverton paper, have implemented a few different um, possible ways that it could affect the uh, expected number of recruits. Uh, and then this is how that all is actually implemented in, in the R side. Um, you have your observations, uh, option for observation error. Um, we've made it generalized in so that you can specify the lag um, and then you could play with that and see what your assessment results look like with different lags. Um, this is where you specify random walker AR1. Uh, in the future, this could be, uh, you know, your environmental covariate would affect growth or some other process besides recruitment. Um, and then this is how uh, that, um, how the, modeled uh, in covariate would actually impact the population. So these are the different recruitment uh, functions. Uh, this is just showing some output, uh, you know, we can model it, uh, have diagnostics. Um, this is results of that compare um, models function that you can just compare the different recruit functions, uh, the different environmental time series functions, and then how that time series affects recruitment and then look at the ASCs in retrospective uh, Mons row. Um, can look at, if you have a Beverton Holt recruitment relationship, you can look at that in if you include effects on the cold pool or not. Uh, you can look at the um, difference in estimated stock status if you estimate environmental effect or not. Sometimes it matters, sometimes it might not. Um, can different, have different uh, options for projecting that environmental covariate. Right now we have, you can continue the random walk, um, which I believe we just talked about in the discussion of that you, why you might not want to do that because um, the, the error is quite large. You can use the last value, you can use an average value, or you can specify values. So you could use that if you were, say, had a forecast of your uh, physical or your environmental covariate. Uh, and then we have projection options for F as well. Um, so that's the current status. It's designed for single species assessment uh, with age structured data. It only has empirical weighted age. There's no option for uh, fitting growth. Um, and then optionally, if you have a clear mechanistic hypothesis that an environmental variable is linked to a demographic process and you have observations on that environmental covariate, then um, you can include that. Uh, it's currently in development. Um, we're happy to work with people and that helps us test the code in different situations. Um, <laughs> yeah, I changed, uh, changed Jim's GitHub picture there. Uh, we're happy to help guinea pigs. Um, it's not, we're not considering it released yet. Um, when we will release it, we'll, we'll have a tag release. So I would advise to take it all with a grain of salt. Things may be changing in ways that would break something that you did yesterday. Uh, future work features we want to add some automated testing, uh, an ARK environmental covariate process, um, effects on other demographic processes. Um, we have a project, potential project on directly fitting uh, multivariate uh, environmental data uh, spatially as well, perhaps. Uh, and then part of a IC's methods working group that Kelly Johnson is leading on building in options on how to uh, vary selectivity and time. 
Uh, so with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Uh, take any questions. Um, and yeah, you guys feel free to check it out. Uh, ask me or Tim any questions you might have. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, can you talk about partitions, uh, space, sex, uh, species? I understand there's been some experimentation along all those lines. Not that I know of for this. Uh, we haven't, well, uh, when I first sat down with Tim and said, what am I going to do with my postdoc time for a year and a half or two years? Um, we had a wham underscore spatial, wham underscore multi-species, wham underscore environment as like brainstormed, but we haven't, uh, right now there's none of those things exist. Um, they could be added in a, either like we've, you've been discussing either like one model that sim simplifies down or as separate modules or to be discussed uh they're yeah not currently planned okay any other questions okay i i have a question this is kind of a little different than technical but um i can see this is a good sort of research model um but why is Woods Hole developing their own stock assessment model and not say taking SAM and, and helping develop that to include the differences between your model and, and the SAM? That is above my pay grade. You should probably ask Tim and Chris Legault that. But um, I mean, in part, I think why he thought it was worth the effort is because they wanted it to replicate ASAP and um, Because that's some of the issues we might talk about tomorrow is what would be the reason for, you know, develop, you know, continuing on a current model, um, bringing teams together to work on the same model, having multiple models going at the same time so that, you know, there's, there's developments occurring in different, um, in different models. So, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? No. I don't think SAM can fit the, it's not a standard option for SAM to fit the catch and age comps this way. You do? So you can do this? Okay. You don't like to do it, but the option is there, hey? <laughs> So Pamela. Yeah, sorry, I haven't been able to make it to much of the meeting, but um, I don't know where you're landing at the moment on whether there should just be one model or, or several, but I, I sort of take issue with your comment, Mark, if you don't mind. Um, it's like you're stopping people from innovating. And I think, um, um, you know, saying, why don't you can use existing models or whatever. I think um, I like the idea of not stopping people from innovating, but of getting together. Maybe there will be one overall model that um, is somewhat dominant. I don't think there will ever be a situation where there'll be one model to rule them all. <laughs> um, and I don't think there should be. I think it's better actually to periodically get together in meetings such as this one and look at the features of each of the models and um, features that are useful, um, integrate them into, into other models. So I, I don't like the idea of stifling in innovation. I guess that was my comment. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily agreeing or disagreeing with you, but it's good to know the motivations why you do things so that when we can make decisions about whether we pull out our um, funding and our um, expertise to make one model or if we break off in groups and there's benefits of both sides. So, so separate groups can actually come up with different new novel um, methodology because they're not thinking in the same way. So, yeah. 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 
Or not. That's, I'm, I'm yeah. happy to sit down, too. Sure. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll agree with both Mark and Tamala. Uh, we, we certainly don't want to do anything that stifles research. And the research efforts, by their nature, are going to be somewhat independent and um, innovative. But that, the question really is, how do we tap into research in order to build things that we will use in a you know, more standardized way in order to support assessment. So separation between research and standardization in order to achieve the efficiency that we need for the assessment process, I think that's where we need to focus. Anders, you had a question? Yeah, no, but I think it's correct. We should postpone this to the discussion. Okay, any other questions for Brian? No. Okay, sweet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>